Ladies and gentlemen, we live in the Middle Ages. Feudalism, the inseparable element is represented by the epoch. In this modified version, the state capitalism reigns absolutely. It, is, it was untouched by the Industrial Revolution, the IT Revolution, and the past economic progress. I cannot agree with Jacques Legault that feudalism ended, ended in the 19th century. It has not passed yet. It persists, and it seems that in the foreseeable future it will not be replaced by another system. We can pose a question. Is it positive or rather negative? I say it's just apologetical for evaluation. Should we be pleased by such a channel of events or aspire to change the establishment? The answer seems clear. In spite of what the conservatives think, I maintain the status quo is by no means the desired state. But what are we to desire? We are forced to live in slavery. This time it is fueled, being far from what it used to be in the past. But paraphrasing Frank Kodorov, slavery is slavery and no amount of words can make it anything else. If we consider liberty and slavery as the most extreme points of the continuum, we will arrive at the conclusion that the Middle Ages did not differ specifically from what we experience today. Every time we have a and distinctions, in some aspects, then they will benefit the capitalism, in spite of the aversion which should fuel towards it. In order, the Middle Ages gain advantage. Frank Kodorov used to say this, that capitalism as a class exploitation system was a direct successor of feudalism. Was he right? <laughs> what are the common features of feudalism and state capitalism? Firstly, the structure of society today is an almost perfect reflection of the medieval one. One percent, which constitute the rich, statists, and what is most important, lobbyists, using some conscious terminology, super statists, are the counterpart of the rulers and his court. Nine percent, those who profit from the existence of the state to the same degree as the 1% is right above. This is the middle class of statists, not possessing such amount of energy initiative to rise to the elite, the equivalent of nobility. And finally, 90% the exploited, slaves and in the past peasants, and to a certain extent townspeople. What's more, this last social group is kept behind the view of uncertainty by the classes above it. This promotes the alienation of respected classes and the creation of specific superstructure designed to legitimize an underlying basis of economic exploitation. Secondly, in both systems we can see a so called triple helix. Feudalism is cemented by an agreement between the rulers, the nobility, and the church, whereas in capitalism these classes are replaced by politicians, big business, and intellectuals. Each group benefits from the actions of the rest. Since they are well aware that they can hold their positions only in the same support to make maintained. Without this agreement, neither of the systems will exist. Thirdly, the division of society is always legalized, that is, it is reflected in the legal system, regardless of it being common or statutory law. Both in the medieval times and nowadays, we deal with the distinction between the, the privileged and underprivileged classes. And fourthly, we can notice a parallel between the property law in the feudalism and in the capitalism. Namely, this concurrence is seen mainly in the character of law, divided property, and the way it is acquired, contract in which the sites possess different rights. And this is the topic of this essay. Feudalism, using Mark Bloch's definition, is a social system in which the characteristic type between persons was a dependence of an elderly on a close period. The system is inseparably connected with class society, in which it is the classes that possess different and corresponding rights, privileges, and possibilities. Such is a narrower definition of the term. The broader one, in turn, maintains that feudalism is an economic system based on the divided land property, in which at least two subjects own a piece of land. One, a senior, has the absolute right to the land, it is called the minimum directum. Whereas the other one, a vassal, only uses and utilizes this land, the minimum utility. Both these definitions are correct, and in this speech I would like to prove that they can be applied to the currently existing system of state capitalism. State capitalism can be defined as an economic system characterized by far reaching state intervention aiming at protecting the, the interests of big business. This model should be separated from the so called lesser fair capitalism which, humorously, differentiates itself from state capitalism 
as much as a chair from an electric chair. <laughs> <laughs> Let my Robert clarify the issue. Robert. The difference between free market capitalism and state capitalism is precisely the difference between, on the one hand, peaceful voluntary exchange, and on the other, violent expro expropriation. And what is more, Kevin Carson states, Capitalism, arising as a new class society directly from the old class society of the Middle Ages, was founded on an act of robbery as massive as the earlier feudal compass of the land. It has been sustained to the present by continual state intervention to protect its system of privilege, without which its survival is in unimaginable. The current structure of capital and ownership and organization of production is our so called market economy reflects course of state intervention. End of quote. Two institutions are characteristic for the comprehension of property rights specific to the Middle Ages, beneficium and precarium. Originally, these terms were used interchangeably, but as time passed, their meanings change. Beneficium, as more honorable and not associated with the request, related mainly to the relation between pupils and between pupils of the under ruler. Bearing in mind the number of the nobility, beneficium was not so common as related to the present precarium. Precarium is a form of divided property. Its name is derived from the Latin word assets which means request, since in the beginning a cousin made a request that he will not lord of the church, so that they would be his guardians. Trepary was the most common form of divided property. Let's look at the way trepary was established. Quote, peasant, free but weak, not being able in times of need and danger to rely on the help from his king, nor from the distant and bureaucratic prince, in search of some social and effective assistance, desiring at the same time to evade the, the compulsory military service for the ruler, ruler prefer to abandon the distracted free freedom and become someone's man subject. The peasant lost his independence and agreed to resign from a large portion of his freedom. However, he didn't become a slave in a strict sense. He possessed the land he cultivated and could use the goods, goods produced. This loss of independence manifested itself in the fact that the peasant, in exchange for protection, gave his land to the feudal lord and received it later as a user. Another privilege was his pension from military service. Still, the peasant was subject to certain expenses, which are collectively called feudal rent. This contract was in fact insoluble, that the peasant was bound by this throughout his life, and often this contract was inherited, regardless of the concept of the weak party. However, the legal inconsistencies consist concerning Trepharion and of his higher legally grounded position of the social ladder, to the Lord compelled the peasant to remain under his protection, freely increasing the expenses he had to bear. What is more, the Lord had the opportunity to punish and even punish the peasant if the latter didn't fulfill the obligations expressed in the contract. During the request from which precarium is derived appeared only in theory. In fact, the feudal Lord was able to use a great variety of means, including force, to constrain the secluded peasant and force him into signing the contract. We can wonder why a peasant having, su having such an extent of freedom agreed to such far-reaching limitation of his right to his body and land. This will be, however, an ahistorical approach. Only since the Enlightenment was the freedom seen as an absolute value, and in the age of the change of freedom was unknown and peculiar. The most important issue for medieval men were expenses, were expenses he had to bear and peace for which he craved. This criteria were decisive in him taking any action so as to improve his position, however incomprehensible it may seem to us. But let's take a closer look at the problem of property today, in times commonly referred to, the, to, to as one of the most free. Can we say that we witness progress and that in comparison with feudalism we took steps toward pure liberty? We can answer the second question affirmatively if by steps we understand the change of people's mentality. They are more self-conscious 
an hour of the life in dangers. They are well keep cut for taking care of the truckers and bombs. But is, it, but is it enough to call the times we live in libertarian? Of course not. And are our times more perfect when it comes to protecting the property rights than the previous people? In my opinion, not at all, which I will attempt to demonstrate. Private property, according to common sense, should, should be such a category of property that is subject to a person and allows unrestricted enjoyment of products of one's labor. This approach will be more or less proper. Nowadays, however, certain activities are prohibited. For example, one cannot legally purchase drugs, one cannot attract the property to the desired extent due to taxes, and cannot even own an object if the state says, says so. Due to restrictions, let us call private, such private property private. After all, if an institution has the power to show the individual what is better for him, or order him to carry out certain activity, we can say that such an institution has an original right to the property of an individual and the products of its labor. Applying the terms characteristic of feudalism, we can say that the state, being a senior in this contract, has dominion directive and the vassal is restricted only to dominion utila. We can conclude that the state generally lets us use a portion of its property. In this regard, the situation today is different from the one in the Middle Ages. There was also a change of parties in the contract. And the contract itself goes as follows. The state, as an absolute owner of all the property on its territory, gives the, the, the individual the right to utilize the land, and in exchange, this individual is obliged to pay certain expenses. The party in power is the state, and its might is far greater than were the capital capabilities, technologically speaking, of any monarch of or noble. It is also worth, worth noticing that this contract comes into force without the individual's consent. It goes without saying that this social contract has nothing to do with the Trudonian vision of social contract which was, in which it is the individual that makes the decision. In the case discussed, a man is forced to live in a state, stripping him of any choice. Is a being dependent on, to a certain extent, the state. Every decision concerning property is regulated by the state, an original owner of all goods. What especially catches our attention is compulsion and unbreakableness of this contract. The state. If a citizen bridged the rules of the contract has the power to punish the citizen. Bearing this in mind, we arrive at the conclusion that the state capitalist society has to be a class one. There are rulers and subjects. Thus, we can mark the definition of feudalism applied to state capitalism. Capitalism is a social system in which the characteristic type of persons is the dependence of an other link from a close leader. In light of these facts, we cannot say that the epoch of state capitalism is libertarian in any sense, since the scale of exploitation and compulsion matches what people were forced to bear in the past centuries. Principles accepted by libertarians and the only consistent with universal ethics, self-ownership and original appropriation, have nothing to do with the reality. They were replaced by a status contract in which it is the state that, that imposes the rules, not caring about what the individual thinks. Hans Hermann Hoppe writes, Exploitation occurs whenever a person successfully claims partial or full control over scarce resources he has not homesteaded, saved or produced, and which he has not acquired contractually from a previous produced owner, producer owner. Exploitation is the expropriation of homesteaders, producers, and savers by late coming no non homesteaders, non producers, non savers, non contractors. End quote. We have arrived at alarming and frightening conclusions. Nothing is in fact ours. Perhaps, perhaps I should make myself more clear. Nothing pro produced according to the requirements set by the state. On the other hand, we can expect that the free market being an emanation of the preferences of all the participants, will find a solution. 
And then, a way to acquire a genuine property rights is country commons. The factual pra practice of human action, which debates and opposes the state intervention, intervention is a counter economic activity. In defiance of so called white market, state market, we can also distinguish grey and black market. Black market is everything prohibited by the state and handed over regardless of that. Grey market means trading goods and services which are not legal but are obtained or distributed in a way prohibited by the state. It turns out, however, that the grey market as we've seen it today is not a remedy for, dis for a dis disease called lack of property black rights. A significant majority of products emerge from the white market which boosts the budget, budget, setting in motion an interventionist state apparatus aiming at plundering the people. A vicious circle emerges. It is so frightening that it can trouble itself infinitely and last forever until the, until the human type has died out. We can quite correctly pose a question. Why is it happening? It was Etienne de la Petite who wrote in the 16th century in his Politics of Obedience, the discourse of voluntary servitude. Quote, he who does not domineers over you has only two eyes, only two hands, only one body, no more than is possessed by the least man among the infinite numbers dwelling in your cities. He has indeed nothing more than the power that you confer upon him to destroy you. Where, where has he acquired enough eyes to spun? He who does not domineers over you has only two eyes, only two hands, only one body, no more than is possessed by the least man among the infinite numbers dwelling in your cities. He has indeed nothing more than the power that you confer upon him to destroy you. Where, where has he acquired enough eyes to spy, spy upon you if you do not provide them yourselves? The feet that trample down your cities, where does he get them if they are not your own? How does he have any power over you except through you? How would he dare assail you if he had no preparation for you? From all these in indignities, such as the very beasts of the field would not endure, you can deliver yourselves if you try not by taking action, but merely by willing to be free. Resolve to serve no more, and you are at once freed. End of quote. So why aren't, aren't people striving to free themselves from the tyranny? Why aren't we approaching a real social contract described by, by Benjamin Tucker? These questions remain, regrettably, unanswered. The future will, will show whether people will realize that the Constitution is in fact a fit, and that the king has always been naked, which is what libertarians endeavor to convey, unfortunately, in fact. Thank you.